So the earlier we intervene, the more likely we are to cure surgically. So microadenomas have a very high rate of cure. Macroadenomas that are more invasive have a lower likelihood of cure. So the surgery is usually the first step as long as there's a tumor that's identified. And a good surgeon is really important. So someone who has great experience in a number of pituitary surgeries would be ideal. After the surgery, we have to reevaluate that patient to determine whether the growth hormone excess is still there. That can take a little time after the surgery. You can check growth hormone right away. In fact, day one and day two post-op levels that are lower are associated with the likelihood of cure, but the real proof of the pudding will come with the IGF-1 level, which has to be done six to 12 weeks after the surgery. And if that's normal, that patient is in remission and can be followed. If that's elevated or the growth hormone is elevated or their symptoms are still there along with elevated levels, then medical therapy is necessary. And there's many different medical therapies now available um, to treat uh, persistent growth hormone excess after surgical failure. We used to think that it was just sporadic, that there wasn't really much genetics to acromegaly except in rare syndromes, but we're learning more and more that, there, that some of these cases can be familial. Um, the ones that we have the genes for are complicated syndromes like multiple endocrine neoplasia, where there are multiple endocrine tumors, including pancreatic, parathyroid, and pituitary tumors, and they're not just acromegaly, they can be any of those um, cases, and that's an MEN1 mutation that occurs um, straight through families, so there'll be usually another family member involved. The patient could be the first one with MEN1, and so if they have all more than one of those endocrine tumors along with acromegaly, they should get tested for MEN1. It's not usually found though, and we actually published a paper very recently in the JCM looking at patients with acromegaly and hyperparathyroidism specifically for MEN1. And all of our patients, there were 22 that we described, were negative for the genetic testing. So, um, we, this, so there's other things that explain these rare cases of hyperparathyroidism and acromegaly, but if you throw in a pancreatic tumor into the mix, then MEN1 becomes more likely, or a third tumor, then it's likely to have the MEN1. Other genetic tests that can be done for cases where there's more than one family member involved as having acromegaly is the AIP mutation, the aryl hydrocarbon interacting receptor protein mutation, which has been described in familial cases of multiple pituitary tumors in one family where you can have more than one family member that has a pituitary tumor and that type of tumor is usually acromegaly. So if you have, for example, a parent and a child or brother and sister, you, you may have an AIP mutation and those usually will present at a younger age of onset. So they're more likely to include patients that have gigantism because they get the disease before puberty. We're still learning about other um, genes and trying to look for them when you have uh, family members that have multiple tumors, acromegaly and prolactinomas or acromegaly and other non-functioning pituitary tumors or just acromegaly that don't have an AIP mutation or an MEN1 mutation and that don't have carnic complex, which is the other gene involved. So there are a few rare genetic syndromes that include multiple endocrine tumors. Some of them are just a pure familial isolated pituitary adenoma syndrome, which is associated with AIP mutations, but all of those are rare. And the most common finding in a patient with acromegaly is that they're the only one in their families that have known to have it, and we don't know the genetics involved. Important, I think, to tell patients that they're not alone. I think um, many endocrinologists or primary care doctors will have only one patient because it is a rare disease and like all rare diseases, it can be a very lonely feeling. I would encourage um, them to get seen if they have you know, any residual disease at all at a pituitary center. One, because these, these are going to be the physicians that are most likely to be aware of all the new available therapies, but also they can then join in even in when we go back to having live waiting rooms. Um, many other patients with acromegaly, and if not, there are online communities as well for patients with acromegaly, um, so that you know they don't feel alone. And I know a lot of our patients enjoy talking to other patients right in our waiting room since we, we specialize in acromegaly. And in the days when we had patients in our office, they were able to chat readily.